So yes, I think both row. Juan and I have met a few of you. My name is Paula Crest. I'm the director of industry and career development at the university. And Oh. <laughs> Hi everyone. Some of you probably already saw me on Monday, but I'm Juan. I'm the Career Development Coordinator here at the Academy. Um, and just to kind of tell you guys a little bit more about who else is in our department, um, Greg Marr, who couldn't be with us here today, um, is actually part of our team as well. And if you're a web design new media student or you do design, he's a great guy to know. Um, he's our industry outreach and curriculum specialist, so he's part of our department too. So. Super excited to have you guys with us. Um, lots of different aspects to today's presentation. So without further ado, we'll get started. If you guys have questions, there'll be time for Q&A. And take it away. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so um, I'm actually going to sit um, here at the edge of the stage. Hopefully, everyone can still see me. That's always, <laughs> always something that's a legitimate concern of mine. So um, to kind of get us all started, to kind of give you a sense of what we're going to cover today, so we only have about a half hour because I want to leave a little bit of room for questions here at the end. So those of you, if there's anything we didn't cover, anything really specific to your situation, we're happy to answer any questions at the end of this. Um, but really today, we kind of wanted to spend a little time giving you guys a sense of the basics, right? So you know, what goes into a cover letter? What goes into a resume? What does that look like? Um, and then more importantly also, what are some different resources, other ways that I can actually connect with opportunity and find the types of internships or positions that I'm interested in, right? Either part-time, while I'm still going through my program to gain some experience, be a lot more competitive once I graduate, or you know, when it comes time for that full-time job search as you're getting ready to get your degree, okay? So again, without further ado, let's talk about the resume, right? And making one piece of paper count. And we'll talk about how and why. So I want to get you guys to kind of think in terms of the recruiter, right? Think in terms of who you're actually giving the resume to, the employer, and how they're thinking and what their process is, right? So if you were a recruiter and you had hundreds of resumes to look through, right? This is your day. Would you hire this person? This is one resume from one candidate, one individual. Who would do it? OK, lots of no's, lots of shaking heads. Thank you. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Amy, we love you. OK. Thank you. <laughs> so um, can everyone hear? Ah, good. All right, so I've got some volume. So I heard a lot of no's, a lot of shaking heads in the audience. OK, so why not? I'm going to pass this mic. Too many pages. OK. <laughs> All right, yes, I love it. All the designers in the room are like, this font, what's going on? Right? So no papyrus, right? That's definitely a no. OK. I heard too many pages. What else? What else is bugging you? Colors. Red. Lots of colors. Red. It's kind of an aggressive color. Too small. OK, really difficult to read. It's all over the place, right? So literally, um, you know, people are kind of making this motion, right? It's really sort of hard to follow, right? All of the margins are a little bit weird. Things are indented in different places. There's no consistency, right? So everything that we just kind of identified, and this, I just want to note really quickly, is actually a resume that I did receive from a student who was looking for assistance. Right? So um, this student absolutely did the right thing, which is they came to me. right? They came and got some support before actually sending this out to employers. And so I kind of wanted to use this as an example of these are just some common kind of mistakes or really just sort of pitfalls that we see. And this is how you can kind of make sure that you don't fall into that. Right? So we talked about the number of pages and how, how hard it was to read. So I do want us to think, how long do you guys think a recruiter actually spends on any given resume? OK, so we've got five to seven seconds, 15 to 30 seconds, one to three minutes. I heard five seconds in the audience. Anybody else? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. OK, maybe a little bit more. OK, so the answer is A, right? You've got about five to seven seconds to wow the recruiter. So again, think about it. If you have hundreds of resumes, if you're a recruiter and you're looking at that many resumes, you don't have a lot of time, right? You're really just scanning. You're not even reading, OK? So you already have a sense of what the job entails, of who you're looking for, and what types of qualifications this person needs to have. And so you're really just scanning a piece of paper in order to find that. And the keywords are going to jump out at you to let you know within that amount of time who you're going to hire, or at least who you want to be able to talk to and move forward in the process. So with that in mind, right, these are some resume musts. Right? So if you've heard some of this advice before, 
this is really why, right? I wanted to kind of give you an example so that you would get a sense of why it is that we tell you some of the things that we tell you or why recruiters are looking in the way that they are and how you need to sort of fit those guidelines to really stand out and get into the yes or the maybe pile, okay? So first and foremost, your resume really needs to be about a page, okay? And I know some of you have been you know, in the industry doing hands-on experience for a certain amount of time, or you've been in other industries, right? Maybe you've been working in finance for the last 10 years, and now you're ready to kind of follow your passion, get your degree from the academy, and work in art and design, right? And so in which case, we're gonna talk a little bit about the different ways, um, in which case you might be able to sort of shrink your resume or really condense it a little bit. This isn't a hard and fast rule, this one page, okay? But really what we wanna emphasize is that you wanna be as concise as you possibly can. Right? You don't want to put everything and every single thing that you've ever done for every single job you've ever held, right? because people aren't even going to be looking at it anyway. Right? So be selective, because the recruiter is going to be pretty selective in how they're looking through your information. Okay? And keep in mind, too, that obviously that information needs to be up to date. Right? So if you just recently got a scholarship, for example, or you just got an internship yesterday, right? you got some great news in your inbox, and you're ready to apply for some you know, part-time work, make sure that that most recent accomplishment is actually on your resume. Okay. Portfolio link needs to be available along with your complete contact information. Right? So if what I see, if I'm a recruiter and I look at your resume and I love what I see, I need to see very clearly how I can get a hold of you and I need to be able to view your work. So who has their portfolio online or at least some <laughs> works in progress available on the internet right now? Okay, it needs to be all of you. So even if you just started your program, you should have some kind of blog, right, where you've got an illustration up or two, that, you know, a sketch, right, a comment about something that you read or an interview with your favorite artist, right? You need to have your work. You need to be sort of generating a certain amount of attention toward your work and the things that you're interested in when it comes to the field that you're studying, okay? So that portfolio link needs to be part of your resume. And another sort of common thing that we see a lot when it comes to students and alums when they're putting together the resume is that it's really easy to fall into that trap of, you know, you list a position, you list a job that you had, and then you just talk about the different things that you did or that you were responsible for, right? We want to encourage you guys to start thinking in terms of accomplishments, right? So it's not just what did you do day to day, right? It's what did you achieve, right? And how did what you contributed actually do something for the organization that you were working for or a part of? Okay. So an example would be, say you did, you know, say you're working part-time at The Gap, okay? Um, and you're interested in visual merchandising, and you were in fact responsible for doing a couple of displays around the store. Don't just say, you know, created displays in store, right? Talk about how those displays actually brought people in the door. Right. So you're thinking about the outcome, okay, the results, and you're noting that in your resume so that it's achievement-based. Does that make sense? Okay. Also, when we think back to that crazy resume that we saw with lots of pages, lots of different fonts, and we talked about how there were indents and margins all over the place, right? you want to make sure that you're consistent. Okay. So if you have bold italics, for example, for all of your section headers, or one of your section headers, make sure you do it for all of them. Okay, so it's about being consistent so that it's uniform and it's easy for the eye to follow. Okay. Um, you also want to use the Academy's Career Toolkit, and I referred to this on Monday as well. Um, this is available to you in the job board. There was actually also a link that I included in that slideshow, and I'll make sure to kind of blast that out to you guys later as well. Um, but there is a checklist in that toolkit that definitely covers all of the information that we're talking about, and it's really handy, I think, after you've drafted your resume to just go through that checklist and make sure that you've actually covered all the different points. Okay, so that is a resource that you should use. Um, and then when I say check your work, proofread it. Right? So I know it's really easy when you're putting together your resume, you've been doing all these different iterations, you've been tweaking the language, you've been messing with the fonts a little bit, right? It's really easy to have typos or grammar and spelling mistakes that you're not catching because you're working with it all the time. So we always recommend having like three different people proofread it a couple of different times, right? So you want to get fresh eyes on it because there's things that other people are going to catch looking at it for the first time that you probably won't. And keep in mind that obviously for a recruiter, they're looking at it fresh as well. So you want to make sure that there are no mistakes by the time it reaches their eyes. Okay. Um, a couple of final notes too of things that we've sort of seen on resumes and recruiters have seen that we wanted to share with you advice-wise. Um, is that 
for those of you who are multilingual, bilingual, right, you know more than just English. Um, if you have language proficiency, that's definitely a plus in this global world, okay? Um, I know that we do have people here who are joining us internationally, um, or even if you are a domestic student um, studying here in the US and you know Spanish, you know Mandarin, you know French, um, you know Portuguese, all of that is a definite asset to any place that you would apply to. So do be sure to note your language proficiency, right? Maybe you can read it and you can't speak it, that's okay. Just note that, okay? Because it is an, it's a definite benefit, it's always icing on the cake. Um, and who knows, you know, that can help you sort of grow in the particular position that you're looking into. And so you just want to make that clear on your resume. That is a strength that you have. Um, if you're a casual social media user, okay, do not bill yourself as an expert. We do definitely see this, right? So if you do tweet about your artwork, right, if you do have a very, you know, a really great Instagram following when it comes to your art, that's fantastic. You've got your Pinterest boards awesome, right? But unless you've done like marketing or unless you're actually looking at SEO and analytics, um, for the most part, right, you don't need to bill yourself as, you know, you don't need to specify that as being an expert, okay? Um, and we also ask that you clarify student work versus professional work, okay? So for those of you who are going through your program right now, you are charged with some pretty interesting and very cool collaborations and projects that you work on in class, and those do definitely count to your experience, okay? Um, I know someone uh, mentioned Studio X earlier. For those of you who are in animation, viz dev, um, it is an opportunity for you kind of to actually work on a short animated film, for example, and actually you know, be part of that pipeline the way you would at Pixar or any other sort of major studio. So that is actual experience that you should definitely note on your resume if that applies to you. That's just one example. Um, but you just want to clarify that it is affiliated with the Academy of Art. It is something that's part of the curriculum that you're doing, and it's not something that is an actual professional studio that you're getting paid to do. Does that make sense? And that's just to be really clear to the employer, you know, what is what. Okay. Um, so I hope everyone can kind of see this. I'm going to kind of talk through a sample resume and kind of talk about what some of the strengths are for this particular resume and where are some areas that they can improve. and. Um, kind of guide you through that. So I'm actually going to kind of stand and go through this. So first and foremost, right, um, and I actually blacked out the student's name just to kind of give them some privacy, but this is an actual academy student. Um, and I just wanted to kind of note there were a lot of different strengths in this particular resume. So if your resume looks something like this, you are definitely on the right track. Okay, so um, I just have her last name, but she did have her first name there in very large font at the top. Um, and I think that's fantastic, right? I just want to note that. You do want your name to stand out, right? You don't want it to be hyper aggressive, but you definitely do want it to be very clear, like this is me, this is all the experience I have. If I'm a recruiter and I'm impressed by what I see, I want to be able to remember and connect that to who you are and what your name is, okay? Um, what's really great is that there's very clearly delineated sections, right? At a glance, I see education, experience, skills, awards, software, language. Okay, so it's very clear right up the front exactly where my eye needs to fall to learn about her professional experience, to find out what her skills are, to find out what different software she's proficient in, you know, whether or not she's an MFA or BFA, right? So it's all very clearly laid out. That's fantastic. Um, the way that she's actually indicated these sections is also really great. So, you know, she's actually been with Prada before, Imperial Armani, right? It's very clear because she's put her section headers in bold, right? And she's kept that consistent throughout, okay? So her workplace and the position that she actually held are really easy to identify. Okay? I don't really have to read very closely to have those things jump out at me because of the way that it's been laid out. There's bullet points, which I always recommend, just because, again, that makes things really easy to scan. Right? Your eye can follow very quickly what some of the key information is. Um, some of the things that I felt that she could do better is that she definitely should have her portfolio URL as part of her contact information. Okay? I do think it's great that her dates, she indicates the month and the year, so it's a lot clearer right? whether or not she was with a place for nine months versus, say, 12 months. Right? If you just put the year, it can get a little bit hazy. So I think in terms of employment periods, it's really nice for employers to be able to see a little bit more specifically how long you were actually with a place or in a particular position. Um, one thing that I think could be better, we talked a little bit about alignment, right, and consistency. So her dates don't really line up, they're not flush, they're on the right-hand side, and that's something that's a detail that might seem really minor, but 
any place that you want to be hired by is going to make sure that you are detail oriented, right? They want to know regardless of the position that you're going to be paying attention to all of the little pieces. So that's one way that you're demonstrating that is through this resume. Um, and then better is that she kind of gets into that mode of just talking about what she did versus framing it in terms of accomplishments or what her contributions actually did for the organization, right? Did she increase sales? Did she streamline processes? Did she lead a team, right? And if so, for how many? These are all ways in which she could really be better demonstrating some of what she's contributed at these really high profile places, okay? Um, and then again, I kind of mentioned the consistent formatting, but overall, Right, it's error free. If you were to actually read through this, you would know that there aren't any typos. Um, and again, for the most part, she really, you know, she kept things bold where they needed to be. She kept consistent fonts. It's really easy to follow. Okay. Um, and then these are just a couple of other examples of resumes that I've seen that I really think really do those things well. Um, this middle one is definitely a little bit bolder, right? It's got a little bit more going on, and I think depending on the company, that can definitely be a plus. For others, it could be a total turnoff, right? So this middle one, I just kind of wanted to show that it really, it's about doing research, it's about knowing your audience and knowing what types of studios, for example, you're applying to. Um, but I think one really cool thing that I wanted to point out about this is that even if he, if this particular student or alum got rid of these other characters and just had that banner sort of showcasing his work there at the header at the top, I think for those of you who are in illustration or animation, et cetera, I think that's one really cool way that you can start to sort of showcase your work and entice people to click on your portfolio link, for example, and see more of what you're capable of doing. And that's one way in your resume that you can start to sort of draw people in. Okay. So we're running low on time, so I'm gonna go very, very quickly through the cover letter. First and foremost, okay, when it comes to cover letters, true or false, it's just a rehash of your resume for the most part, it's just a, in written form. False. Yes, for those of you who said false. Okay, um, that might seem obvious, but I do want to talk a little bit about what a cover letter does that is definitely different from a resume, okay? Um, so obviously the resume is almost like a one-page sort of fact sheet about you, right? Um, but the cover letter kind of tells a little bit more of a story. It sort of connects the dots, right? It sort of leads someone through your professional journey it sort of says, okay, the resume is like, here's all the different things that I've done. The cover letter is saying, this is how all of this cohesively turns me into the type of professional that I am, that I want to be for you, okay? So what does that look like? So first and foremost, cover letters should definitely highlight what you want employers to be paying attention to in your resume, okay? So you do want to mention one or two specific examples from your resume that really capture parts of the job description, right? So when you read through a job description, you wanna look at, okay, what are things that they're emphasizing? What are they definitely looking for? What do they tend to repeat in terms of skills or experience that they want, right? And in your cover letter, you wanna emphasize those things so that when the employer looks at your resume, they're noticing those things more so than they might otherwise, okay? So it's almost like giving them a bit of a map. Um, it also helps contextualize your experience, okay? So again, for those of you who might be moving into art and design after years in a totally different sector, a totally different industry, part of you might be saying, well, you know, I just started out in my program. You know, obviously all of my work experience so far has just been you know, kind of basic foundation student work. I don't really have a lot on my resume to really sort of prove that I you know, am on my way to being the artist and the designer that I know that I, I can be, okay? So the cover letter is an opportunity for you to sort of frame that and put that into context. Okay, to kind of talk about maybe how your years of experience in this other field have really driven you into art and design and how some of the skills and experience that you've acquired really kind of are helpful in the art and design world. Okay, so it kind of again leads people through your journey so that you can be more competitive with people maybe who already have some of the years of experience that you're looking for or that they might be looking for in that particular role. And also, obviously, the cover letter, it being written out the way that it is, it does demonstrate how you communicate, okay? So again, that's where spelling, grammar, all of that comes into play as well. They wanna know that, you know, if you stand in front of a client, that you know how to express yourself well, that you can lead a team, that if you send an email to your supervisor or a coworker, right, that it is gonna be professional and clear and actually communicate what it is that is needed, okay? So, what that means, is that you definitely need to correctly spell the name of the company that you're applying to and the person that you're addressing in the cover letter. 
And we do recommend that you use resources like LinkedIn, company websites, et cetera, right, to get a feel for who you should actually address your cover letter to. Chances are you really shouldn't be saying to whom it may concern. Okay, there's enough information out there in the world where you can get a sense of, okay, who's the director of HR, right? Who, what's the name of a recruiter? And even if it's not that person who ultimately sees your cover letter, it shows that you've done your research. And that's really important. That's gonna make you stand out, okay? Um, so again, correct spelling, that's really important, especially in the time when you're sort of really applying for a lot of different jobs and you're blasting out multiple, okay? So don't, it's easy to make the mistake of sending a cover letter that you sent to EA, right? And then being like, Hi, Riot, I'd love to work for you. Okay, EA is not going to hire you if you're putting the wrong company on your cover letter. Um, you wanna mention definitely your passion and why you're interested in this particular position, right? What makes you qualified? Um, and then two to three examples that are very specific as to how your experience matches what they're looking for. Okay, so that should be in your cover letter. Um, other things that you want to include is that, especially for game companies or other companies that you might be applying to, Pixar, Disney, Instagram, um, specify that you're a fan, right? And be really specific about how, okay? If you've played a particular, you know, video game company's games before, talk about what level you're at, talk about what your summoner name is, right? Be specific, let them know that you actually care about the services and products that they put out, okay? And if you've had the opportunity to meet someone from that company, okay, either at a networking event, an industry on campus event, um, whether or not they came to your class to speak at one point, review portfolios, okay. If you've met, be sure to identify who it was that you met by their title and their full name, okay. Talk about when and under what context you met that person and what you've done since that encounter, right. So that's especially important if you did have your portfolio or your work looked at, right actually apply the feedback that you got and mention that you have actually improved your portfolio. Welcome them to take a look. Okay, that's what your cover letter should do. Um, and then again, really quickly, I'm gonna kind of talk through a sample cover letter and things that I think are going really well in it and areas in which I think it could be improved. So again, the name kind of anchors the page, which is fantastic. Um, so this particular student just indicated right off the bat production management. That's what she's interested in doing. That's the role, okay? Which is great because it already sort of brands and makes official that this is what she bills herself as and this is what she's interested in doing. Um, and I think that header is also fantastic because if that header, I, I see that header on her resume and her cover letter, I start to associate that design, that look with this person, right? So thinking about branding, especially those of you who are designers, that's to your advantage, okay? Um, she put, Dear Pixar Animation Studios, again, I recommend that she actually research the name of someone to address the cover letter to. Um, but in that first paragraph, she does a really good job of identifying immediately what position she's interested in, the fact that she's getting a degree here at the academy, okay? Um, and she mentions some of the key words from the job description, right? That she's good at problem solving, she's good at project management, she's got leadership skills. So that's really gonna entice the HR representative, right, the recruiter to actually read on and see more specifically how she's demonstrating that throughout her time at the academy and in her work, okay. Um, what I think could be better is just length. Again, we kind of talked about how busy people are. This is, there's a lot of great content in this cover letter, but I think ideally there are different ways in which I worked with her to be able to kind of condense it a little bit because ideally this line is probably where it should cut off right, lengthwise. And again, that's not a hard and fast rule, but I think less many times is more when it comes to applications. Paul? Five minutes. Oh, five minutes, okay, perfect. Um, so I just wanna talk really briefly about finding opportunity, okay? So we've talked about actually, you know, putting together application materials, and now let's talk about, okay, now you're actually looking for different positions and where do you go about, or how about, how do you go about doing that? So when do you guys think you should start looking? C. So say you want a job. C. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> What's up? C. C, okay, five to six months before. Jobs are being posted all the time though, right? So do you think maybe one to two months before, two to three weeks before, what do you think? All the time? <laughs> okay. Um, for those of you who are thinking five to six months ahead, yes, right? And we want you to plan ahead, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about why you wanna be planning a semester ahead. So say you wanna intern in the fall, 
Okay, so really school starts for the fall in about two months. Okay, say you're interested in landing an internship at that point. You're probably, or you could be too late, especially if there's companies that have official internship programs. So what do I mean by that? So here's an example. So Sony PlayStation, for example, um, and I just want to note, they have internship opportunities in all sorts of fields, so you don't have to be in games to intern for Sony. Um, but first and foremost, if you notice, right, so for those of, so those of you who would want to intern for Sony PlayStation, your next opportunity isn't until spring, okay? They're not even going to post about their spring internships until September, okay? So if you're interested in fall, you would have found out earlier this month whether or not you got that internship. So that's why we say you need to plan ahead, especially for these larger companies that have actual internship programs because they need to plan ahead as well and so they need to get their applications in and so even if you find out later that you have more time than you thought at least you know right you've done the research and you know okay this is the amount of time that I have to get my recommendation letters this is the amount of time that I have you know to actually put together my resume my cover letter spruce up my portfolio um, junior year is definitely the best time to intern okay just because you'll have a much more competitive piece of work at that point, or bodies of work. Um, and also, to kind of talk a little bit about opportunities and where to find them, definitely our job board. If you have trouble logging in, okay, crew development at academyart.edu is who you email, right? And do give me your student ID number, because I can't help you otherwise, okay? Um, and that is actually on the login page. So it does tell you exactly what to do. If you have trouble, my email is there. Um, so I just want to point out, in our job board, you can actually filter for full-time, part-time, and internship positions. There are different tabs where you can actually go in and narrow your search automatically. Um, that's also, there's also a news feed on the landing page where we talk about online chat series that's coming up in the fall each semester, um, and certainly any industry on campus events that are available to you as an online student that might be recorded, live streamed, et cetera. Um, LinkedIn, okay, another great resource. We mentioned that earlier. Um, so I just want to point out, so if you have a LinkedIn profile, what's great is that you can actually look up different people in the company in different positions, right? So once I start to type in a company name that I'm interested in, immediately LinkedIn actually suggests some different common searches. So people who work at Riot, okay, people who used to work at Riot Games, and jobs at Riot Games. So automatically, these are some different searches that you can put into LinkedIn that are going to take you exactly where you want to go. What's really cool is that it gives you information about that particular company, any news updates that they have. It tells you how many jobs are posted on LinkedIn from that company. It tells you how you're connected to different people who already work there. Okay. So LinkedIn is kind of a great resource in that way. And for those of you who are fine artists, I don't want to leave you out. Okay, I know Melinda has definitely mentioned before, Workbook is a fantastic resource. Okay, so there is a directory there on that homepage for those of you who are fine artists. And in that, you can actually look for a specific company. Or there's that drop down menu under category where you can start filtering for if you're in advertising, Workbook is fantastic. If you're looking for art buyers, if you want to be represented, right, you need an art representative. Um, that's a way that you can start searching. It points out different design studios, photography studios. So Workbook is in many ways kind of the LinkedIn for those of you who are fine artists and looking to build your career in that field. Okay. And the art list as well. Okay. So I think for those of you who are in fine art specifically, you're probably going to want, you know, you want to exhibit your work, right? That's kind of where you're building up your credibility. Um, and so the art list is a great resource in terms of different contests that you can apply to, fellowships, residencies competitions. It's also a place where you can upload your portfolio so that these different studios, they, it is a resource that they go to to find new talent as well to sort of curate their exhibitions. And so the art list I think is fantastic. There's calls for public art, juried work. So there's different opportunities for you as a fine artist on this website. Um, and then very quickly, these are just some things. Obviously social media is a great way. You guys are all online students. Um, and so you've already sort of seen how the internet can kind of connect you globally a lot more widely than you might otherwise be able to do. 
Um, and so just paying attention to different galleries and their Instagrams and following them, for example. Um, paying attention to different companies. They do post jobs on Twitter, for example. So as long as you're sort of hooked up and into those different platforms, there are ways in which you can be the first to know about an opportunity that you'd be able to apply to. Okay. Obviously, building your personal and professional network. Um, what we're doing here at Summer Expo is all about that, right? And we're going to explore a little bit more of that later on. Um, this morning when we talk about professional pitches, but you know, how do you introduce yourself as an artist, as a designer to people right off the bat? We're gonna talk about that. Um, but the more people you know, the more <coughs> opportunities you can find out about and refer people to or find a crew, for example, to you know, do your first short or your first feature film. Um, Craigslist, okay, is maybe an interesting resource for some people to hear about. We do definitely get credible companies who have come to us you know, high profile companies that have come to us and said, we definitely post on Craigslist. Obviously on Craigslist, you do wanna do your research and make sure that this is a legitimate company, a legitimate opportunity. That is definitely for sure, but do know that legitimate positions do get posted on Craigslist and that is one place that you can look. Um, and then for those of you who are looking to intern, Look Sharp is actually one of our premier partners. They used to be called Intern Match. Um, they just have a lot more of a robust sort of offering at this point. So definitely look for Look Sharp. Um, and it does definitely tie you into different internship opportunities. They focus exclusively on internships. And so that's another really great web website to sort of plumb the depths of. So, yeah. Um, and then these are just a couple of academy resources that are available to you. I know we do actually have a representative from ARC here today, the right. Academic Resource Center. Um, but so I want to give a shout out to them. They are fantastic. They offer a speaking lab. Um, you know, they talked a little bit to you on Monday morning as well about some of the services that they offer. We definitely collaborate with them, and they are a great resource. Um, we do often off offer that online career chat series, which I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, if you're an international student, the international department is the first place to go if you're interested in working in the US, either part-time or interning. They know all of the details about that. Thank you.